Well, um, I changed my uh, mind on what I was doing a couple of times this week. Um, we had an event in the family this week. On Monday evening, my wife's mother passed away. And um, we know, of course, that two of our uh, number have recently gone to be with the Lord. So uh, death has been a little bit on our minds recently. Uh, with my wife's mother, we're not quite sure of her spiritual state. Um, uh, but it's still profitable to think about this subject, strange as it may seem. Uh, you know, we're told in the book of Ecclesiastes that it's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by a sad countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. We don't naturally think that way, do we? Uh, certainly the natural man doesn't. Um, I was trying to think before about my first experience with death was when my step-grandfather died. I wasn't quite 11. And it was kind of a strange death. He had an automobile, automobile accident and it kind of unhinged him a bit. They had him in for an operation, and they discovered lung cancer. In a few months, he was dead. And he was quite a, a, a fit man. He used to take me out fishing in his boat all the time, and I quite enjoyed that. Um, and then, uh, I don't know if you know, the, the custom in, in many funerals in America is there's an open coffin, <clears throat> at, at least at the wake, at what's called the wake. Um, and uh, I wasn't quite prepared for that. <laughs> so at the age of about 10, I uh, had my first introduction to death, and it wasn't a good one. Um, and I, I guess we may feel there's no such thing as a good introduction to death. But, um, but uh, Solomon tells us that it's, it's a good thing to have our minds on death, not morbidly so, but, but just to consider the reality of it. And as I say, that's the exact opposite of the way the, way the natural man thinks. Um, but that is often the case with truth versus what people commonly think. As we were just saying about, about conversion, uh, people want to think that there's nothing wrong with them. Nothing needs to change really very much. I mean, they're not quite that bad. Well, in the subject of death, we are reminded in Romans that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love him. And so all things must include death, mustn't it? Uh, and so I want to think with you a few moments this morning about um, why it's good for us to think about the subject of death. First of all, if, if after the fall in the garden, there were no death, that would mean that we would all live forever as sinners. Uh, always experiencing this misery of sin, never enjoying the full presence of God as we might. Uh, but God has devised a plan whereby we can be freed from sin, and that plan involves death. Uh, also, death reminds us of the love of God because Christ loved us and gave himself for us. Death was the great example of love. Um, it's amazing, God's plan, this terrible, awful thing of death. And it is a terrible thing. It's an awful thing. I've thought about this. You know, if you've ever been in the presence of someone who died, uh, there's a certain awesomeness about this. Life has left this body. This person is no longer the way they were. Um, but God has taken this awful thing and by his grace, uh, made it a, a wonderful thing in that Christ was willing to undergo this for us. The immortal one was willing to take on a human nature and experience suffering and death for our sake. Uh, I'm sure the angels must have been amazed as they realized what God was planning and what he was going to do. Um, Another thing about death is, to be reminded of it, is a good thing because it is something we will all face. Uh, we don't like to think about it, but it's true. We're told in Hebrews that it is given unto us once to die, and then comes the judgment. 
And so as there is a day when we will all give an account before God. And even though for the believer, our judgment day has truly passed. Our judgment day was Calvary on the cross. That's where the judgment on believers fell. And so we won't face that kind of judgment, but we are told there's going to be some kind of an evaluation of our service, how we have served Christ in this world, what we have done with the talents that God has given to us. Um, but it won't be what the impenitent will experience, uh, the terror of standing before a holy and angry judge whose wrath they cannot bear, but they must and will bear. Uh, and nothing like death reminds us of that. Uh, of course, we all want to avoid thinking about death, but Solomon warns us it's not good to do that. Um, we'd rather much be in the house of feasting than in the house of mourning. Um, but Solomon says it's better the other way around. I've often thought that one of the reasons why the spiritual decline that we are experiencing and have been for some time is somehow related to the fact that in our modern society, death is hidden from us. No one wants to think about it or see it. You know, people are often nursing homes, so we don't see these old people who are near death. And uh, and any thought of death is, it's the one taboo subject. If you want to kill a conversation and cause people to leave, just start talking about death. Uh, thank you for staying so far. <laughs> um, but certainly death was much more a present reality in past generations uh, it was a much more familiar visitor there were larger families because no birth control and many children many died in infancy many died in childhood many women died in childbirth uh, life was much harder um, but what Ecclesiastes is telling us is that uh, death is necessary for us to get our focus where it should be, towards God, towards our relationship with him, and towards the next life. Sadly, the easier life is, the less likely we are to seek God. Those who are comfortable and rich and have no need of anything, uh, they, they don't think about their need of God. They don't feel it. Uh, that's not to say that um, wealth... Uh, anesthetizes us and keeps us keeps well, wealthy people can never be saved but it's undeniable that there is a greater desire generally speaking a greater interest among those who have less in this world than those who have much they're not interested in leaving this world because they have it so good and to a large extent that's true for much of western society which you have to believe that that's a part of the reason why there's so little interest in the gospel I'm fine. You know, I've got a nice life. I've got money. I've got, you know, nice things to, to, to entertain me. I don't need your, your God. Um, being reminded of death is uncomfortable and unpleasant, which is perhaps what you're feeling at the moment. Uh, but it causes us to think about things we need to think about. Death is often a factor in causing people to seek God. You remember the classic story of Martin Luther. He was almost struck by lightning and it terrified him. And that was what caused him to start seeking God. And God eventually found him and used Martin Luther to change the church and the world. Um, so we have to face our mortality and the fact that one day this life is going to end. And then we start asking questions. Well, what's going to happen? <laughs> what's going to happen to me? Where am I going to be? And by God's grace, that leads some people to seek him and to seek Christ and forgiveness. Not all, by any means. Uh, many just shut, shut it out. I find that human beings have a, another ability. It's called denial. We are so adept at denying that which we don't want to deal with and don't want to face. What happens after almost all funerals? Most of the people rush off to the pub. To have a few drinks to forget about what they just heard and what about they just what they just saw. Um, another thing about death for believers, death reminds us what we read in Ezekiel, that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. 
but rather that they turn from their sin and live. So when someone dies, like my mother-in-law just recently, or anyone really, it can spur us on, reminding us of that reality, uh, reminding us that all the people around us are dying, uh, and few of them have a saving knowledge of Christ, as far as we can tell. Uh, so they face far worse than any of the misery. I, I, you've probably heard too, oh, well, my hell is in this life. No, it isn't, friend. No, it isn't. There is nothing in this world that even begins to compare with hell, because hell has no end. Endless. Endless. And aside from open-air preaching or handing out tracts, funerals are one of the few places where people might still hear the gospel, and they might go because they want to respect the one that they knew who died. My wife, June, wants me to take the funeral for her mother and most of her family are unconverted. So there's gonna be a wonderful gospel opportunity there. Please pray for me. It won't be coming up for a while for various reasons, but, um, but the last thing and most important thing for the believer is death is the doorway to endless joy. We will see Christ who we have not seen yet. And we will know him in a way we have never known him in this world. Uh, we will be reunited with those that we know that have gone on ahead of us. We will enter that place, Peter tells us, wherein righteousness dwells. You see, righteousness doesn't dwell in this world. It's found in this world, in the church, but it's not really our home, is it? Uh, and so it's not really the home of righteousness. Uh, it's that new heavens and that new earth wherein righteousness dwells, and that's where we'll be, living in a completely sinless and joyful world. Uh, not only will all the people there be sinless, but the very air we breathe will be without sin, without that continual drag against us and, and towards sin and towards that which displeases God, all of that which exists in this life. Heaven, as far as I can tell, will be so different from what our experience has been here that it's hard for us really to conceive of what that will be like. It's funny that the, the Bible doesn't give us a great deal of information uh, in detail about heaven. And I take that because we wouldn't be able to appreciate it. <laughs> we wouldn't really be able to appreciate it. You know, what, what we are told about heaven is what is not there not what is there, because in our present state, I don't think we could quite grasp the reality of sinlessness in a sinless world in which there is no sin, in which we are in the presence of Christ continually. Um, the book of Revelation gives us this little glimpse, but you'll see most of what it says is what heaven is not. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. One uh, lovely hymn tells us, Life's tears shall be changed to rejoicing, its labors and toil into rest. There we shall find refuge eternal from sin, from affliction, from pain, and in the sweet love of the Savior, a joy without end shall attain. I really like the lovely children's hymn, at least I think it's supposed to be a children's hymn. Uh, it's in our hymn book. Uh, part of it says this, There is a city bright, closed are its gates to sin, naught that defileth, not that defileth can ever enter in. There in the snowy dress of the redeemed, I'll stand faultless and stainless, faultless and stainless, safe in that happy land. <laughs> I, I love that, that little hymn, safe in that happy land. That's heaven. That's where death will take the believer. God shall cause even death to work together for good 
for all that love him. So while it may not be pleasant, death has its rewards for those who trust Christ. Let's pray.